Thank you. So for the next talk, we go to South Korea with Yong Hil Shin, who will talk of geometric all effect in spinal Bosenstein condensate. Thank you. <clears throat> First, I want to thank the organizers and the program committee for inviting me to here. And it's really my honor and pleasure to give a talk in this uh, great conference and especially to the great audience of you. OK. Uh, as we all know, the atom is a composite uh, particle having a spin. So actually, the atomic BEC is a superfluid system with the internal spin degree of freedoms. So once you allow the system to reveal its internal beauty, then you can uh, have a very interesting opportunity to study that the superfluidity together with the magnetic ordering. So spin up uh, bosine condensate has been intensively studied in the for the last uh, decades. And then uh, because of the uh, uh, rich symmetry of the system, one can think of uh, the new topological and the collective excitations, and also depending on the various conditions, one can think of exotic superfluid ground state, and the many interesting superfluid and the spin dynamics has been observed and reported in many works. And recently, we have a very nice review papers about these activities uh, from Dan Stepakon and then Masahito Ueda and then Dr. Gawaguchi also. Okay. Uh, I believe that one of the intriguing aspects of this uh, system is a very close relation between uh, the gauge symmetry and the spin state symmetry of this system. So actually, I want to illustrate that uh, aspect with this following example. Uh, here we have a one plus one spin state, and then let's make uh, some rotation um, of this uh, spin then obviously uh, spin making a rotation and move it back to where it was. Now we have a still one plus one spin state, but you have a, a additional uh, quantum mechanical phase acquired. That is a Berry phase, we know very well. And obviously the spin rotation uh, can affect superfluid phase in this way. Also another interesting example is the one zero spin state. Here we have a one zero spin state and let's make a flip along that x direction. Then again, you have a one zero spin state, but you have a minus one factor over there. This minus one factor is, uh, corresponds to the pi phase shift for your superfluid phase. So from these two examples, you can immediately see that uh, spin rotation can uh, effect, affect the superfluid phase, and obviously, consequently, superfluid dynamics can be affected with the spin rotation. So in this presentation, I want to describe a very simple experiment which I've done with the spin polarized bosons and condensate, which have this type of uh, spin textures. Here the spin is, it looks like a fountain-like spin texture. Sometimes it is uh, named as a skirmion spin texture. And then uh, from this uh, the previous two examples, you can immediately see that this special variation of spin rotation, orientation, uh, can affect, the very, uh, very interesting way, affect the superfluid dynamics of this system. And the main message of this talk I'd like to deliver is that this one. Actually, this superfluid can uh, affect and you feel that effective Lorentz force uh, due to this uh, non coplanar spin textures. That's actually, that is the main message I'd like to deliver uh, with this talk. Uh, in this slide, I want to uh, describe how that the Lorentz force can arise due to that the spin texture by considering the following situation. Here we have a neutral atom with a spin and then moving in this plane. And here we have a specially varying magnetic field. And then due to the Zeeman energy, uh, we assume that the adiabatic conditions. Atom is moving and very slowly, and then spin is adiabatically following that the local field directions very nicely. And then let's think about uh, this particle making a loop here. Then correspondingly, atom spin would make uh, some kind of a cyclic evolution on this spin sphere. Then apparently, this particle would get the spin very phase, and that very phase can be described like this, expressed like it is line integral along this path. Actually, this form is actually, uh, we saw that in the yesterday, the, the, Dr. Schneider's talk. And then here, we can define that the vector potential along this line as a function of the position. And then this is a very 
it, this has a very close form to that the Aharonov bone phase of, for the charged particle moving in this uh, magnetic field. So apparently, we, you can immediately see that uh, spatial variation and the temporal variation of this uh, vector potential can lead us to that effective magnetic and electric field for the neutral particles like this way. And then you have a so-called emergent electromagnetism of a spin origin with this mechanism. I'd like to remark two things on these uh, uh, expressions. Actually, this one is a gauge invariant uh, parameter, uh, quantity. So you can see that here is B is a unifactor. This is parallel to that uh, the direction of the field directions of the real magnetic field of there. So here is the B field, electric field, is expressed as a real values like that way. And also this uh, uh, expression is nothing but the geometrical curvature of a field direction of the real magnetic field over there. So it's geometrically defined. When you are given uh, a real magnetic field distribution, you can immediately see that this type of effective magnetic field arise. So the second point is uh, this effective field is a proportion of the spin numbers. Here's the MF. Actually, Berry phase is a proportion of the spin numbers. So if you have uh, this uh, uh, effective field, then this effective field is spin-dependent effective field. So immediately you can see that, that this system will show you that the spin-dependent hole effect, the spin-hole effect. Actually, this emergent electromagnetism has been studied for many, many years with uh, many different uh, systems. For example, in condensed matter systems, people observed the anomalous hole effect many years ago. Uh, a certain B field and certain temperature, material shows some kind of a uh, whole non-zero and whole resistance. And then it turns out that that ferromagnetic material have uh, some kind of a non coplanar uh, magnetizers and spin texture. And then when the conducting electron flow through this material, this uh, conducting electrons spin somewhat coupled to the magnetization and they feel that the effective magnetic field and then show that uh, whole effect. And then that mechanism can have a spin current, a coupling between the spin current and the magnetization these days actively exploited in that the spin tronics applications. Here is the people want to control that the spin current with the magnetization and vice versa. And that mechanism very actively is investigated in this area. Also, emergent electromagnetism is uh, demonstrated in the neutral photon system also. Uh, this is one of the example. Here is a, a photon is propagating along the helical waveguide and then they observe that the spin polarization dependent the lateral shift of this uh, uh, light propagation. And then they describe it as a photo, uh, opto, uh, no, it's a, the optical spin hole effect. And also, uh, we all know very well, synthetic magnetic field is generated by that the, applying the, the Raman laser on the bosine condensate and then quantum gases. This is kind of nicely pioneering work by the Ian Spielman group it here is JQI. And that one is also can be described as the effect of a pseudo-spin texture. That pseudo-spin texture is kind of formed by the applied Raman beam in the dressed atom picture. So it's a, all thing is kind of uh, having the basic uh, kind of fundamental uh, mechanism or sharing fundamental mechanism together at the same mechanisms. And then uh, in this uh, the, the talk, I want to describe the one simple experiment which is using the real atomic spin texture to uh, generate this kind of a, a gauge field, which is a spin of bosine condensate in a, a magnetic quadratic field. This slide shows the schematic of our experimental setup. Uh, we have, uh, so you are using the, the sodium condensate and the one minus one state, and then that one is confined in an optical dipole trap like this way. Uh, this condensate is a very, very oblate shape, and then along the axial direction, it has about the 370 hertz, and then along the radial confinement is provided by this uh, magnetic field to the Gman energy. And if you zoom up this area, then it looks like this way, and then the coil, magnetic coil is produced at the three-dimensional quadrupole magnetic field, and then we place a zero field point just above the condensate. And then this condensate somehow is free to move in this plane and then move under this kind of zero field point. And then in this plane, as you can see that the B field pointing looks like a fountain-like. So this external magnetic field forcefully imposing the scrumian spin texture on the condensate. 
So it's keep following the spin texture when it is moving around it. Uh, this is the cross-section view of the quadruple magnetic field. And then you can immediately calculate what kind of battery curvature and what kind of effective magnetic field we can have in this kind of a spatially varying magnetic field. And this is the result. And as you can see that uh, around the zero field point, the gate field and effective magnetic field is pointing inward toward, uh, to the, the zero field point. Actually, when you remind of the fact that the battery coverage is nothing but uh, special curvature of the field direction of the real magnetic field, then you can immediately understand these structures. Uh, at zero field point, the magnetic field direction is not defined. And also, around this, around this zero field point, you can have every pointing of a field direction. So you can have um, every curvature direction around the zero field point. So which means that uh, in the real magnetic field, you have a zero field point, then that zero field point can act as a sink or a source for your gauge field over there. So here is representing as a kind of a uh, minus charge monopole uh, for our one minus one spin state. So it's a monopole structures. So now we have a little bit different language to describe our system. Uh, get rid of a spin texture, we can describe this uh, system as a superfluid in a gauge potential. Here we have effective magnetic monopole, and then below we placed our condensate, superfluid condensate. So uh, obviously uh, this, there is a magnetic field flux penetrating through this condensate that is the amount of 0.13 H. By the way, the total magnetic flux uh, produced by this uh, monopole is about 2H, is 2H exactly, 2H, because it's spin one particles. It's a very small flux getting through. And then there is a kind of some kind of requirement for the superfluid should follow, that is Mormino relation. This is a superfluid velocity, and this is curl should be uh, equal to the minus BE. This should be satisfied, which means that uh, you have a B field then you have a mass flow, superfluid mass flow should be there. And obviously this is a, co a correlative vortex state. Uh, so even though it looks like a very stationary, due to the spin, uh, spin winding, you have a really mass flow inside this uh, superfluid. The interesting way to understand this correlative vortex is the following. Initially, let's assume this uh, effective magnetic monopole is uh, placed, uh, located at infinity over there then you have a uniform magnetic field. <clears throat> there is no superfluid mass flow. But now you are bringing this infinity zero field point or magnetic monopole along this G line and up to here. Then clearly you have increasing that magnetic flux penetrating through the condensate. Then once you have increasing magnetic flux, then you would generate this kind of induced electric field, which is the azimuth cell directions. That azimuth cell directions electric field would keep that the condensate rotate. And then now you have a the persistent current at the end in this situation. So that's probably a more interesting way to understand these initial situations. Now, okay, we can imagine that we have a monopole just above the condensate. But the most important thing is that uh, about the B field is that uh, checking out uh, if, uh, uh, if we can detect that the Lorentz force or not. So one easy way to of course, obvious way to detect the Lorentz force is to let it move and then check uh, if this uh, part object is filled at the Lorentz force, which is orthogonal to the movement and also the magnetic B field. But it turns out that the, the B field, the Lorentz force, is very, very small in our situations. In terms of a cyclone train frequency, this frequency is given by h bar over m z m squared. Z m means it's kind of a distance between the zero field point and our condensate. This is kind of a 0.1% one, uh, of our uh, trapping frequency, which means is if you let it move inside this uh, trap, then it's very difficult to discern what is that the contribution from the Lorentz force in that movement. But we have an uh, uh, idea to detect that one, which is using the resonant uh, amplifications. For example, you are uh, you can kind of driving along the x direction resonantly. Then there's a back and forth moving back and forth and then the amplitude is getting larger and larger. But here, even though the Lorentz force is very small, that Lorentz force is generated along the y direction, but that one is also modulating the same frequency as the trapping frequency along the y direction. So even though it's very, very small force, it can be amplified and then later on might be uh, amplified to the, the, the level 
which we can detect in our system. So that's the idea, and that's what we've done. The way we're driving our condensate problem is applying at the modulation of the external bias, bias field. And along this x direction, we apply the modulation of the bias field. That would be shaking our trapping potential back and forth. But here we have to note that uh, that kind of modulation uh, can also is kind of shaking our magnetic monopole back and forth in this way. Then again, uh, we will have another type of a force, which is kind of spin motive force. Once you have a, char a monopole, then it's moving back and forth, then obviously due to kind of a uh, time variation of the magnetic field, you would have an induced electric field. That is this type of uh, spin motive force. And then together with the Lorentz force, which is kind of uh, given like this way, then the total force, uh, the condensate of the field is given like this way. And then there's a V minus a Vm. M is kind of monopole velocity, and then V is kind of a condensate velocity. And across that uh, magnetic field in this way. So, and then that is nothing but that uh, effective Lorentz force in the frame of uh, the, the monopole. So actually, you can immediately see that kind of Lorentz transformation between the electric force and the Lorentz force, and then that two force is kind of uh, combined and uh, appears as a Lorentz force in the one other, the other reference frame. And then this is a single particle uh, equation. Uh, and then we want to check that, that how much that the amplitude we can see in our uh, systems. So here, this is kind of a equation of motion in the spin texture frame. And this is kind of restoring force. And this is a Lorentz force. And this is external driving force we are generating in our system. And with the, our uh, parameter for two micrometer kind of a, uh, shaking, and then uh, separation between the monopole and our condensate is about 36 micrometer. And then this is what we have with this kind of a simple single particle equation. And then uh, x, x motion is linearly amplifying. It's kind of understood, understandable with the easy resonance phenomena. And then y directional motion is, uh, is not that bad. Uh, about a half second driving, the amplitude would be about kind of a five micrometer or something like that. So it is detectable. So we just push that experiment. And this is what we have. This is an in-situ image of our condensate trapped in our, uh, uh, in our setup. And then this is the, about a 200 millisecond driving. We still have a oscillation along the x direction. But later on, after the 600 millisecond driving, what we observe is this kind of a circular motion is appears in our systems. So this is the trajectory. Uh, time evolution of our trajectory of condensate. As you can see that it linearly, it simply is uh, amplifying the x directional motion. But after 300 milliseconds, it showed that the y directional motion, and after the 100, 500 milliseconds, it developed a kind of a circular motion over there. So this is, I want to uh, emphasize that this is a driven system. So it's a linearly driven system. It's a generated kind of circular motion. So in that sense, uh, we describe this phenomena as a whole geometric hole effect of the spinner boson condensate in our systems. Also, we checked at the y-directional motion, y-directional driving, and the diagonal direction. And then in every direction, we uh, observe the same behavior of this kind of a developing of the circular motions. OK. And then next, I want to discuss the superfluid dynamics we observed of this uh, condensate in this gauge field situations. Of course, I mean, our uh, condensate is not a single particle at all. Uh, initial condensate already is called its vortex state. So it has an internal mass flow inside the condensate. So it's a very complicated system. But, but we want to try, uh, want to understand that the, the, the response of the, this uh, superfluid under this kind of gauge field. The first noticeable uh, response of the superfluid system is uh, nucleation of the quantized vortices in the circulating condensate. Here is the time of flight images of our condensate under the linear driving. driving. First, um, about half seconds, you know that this now is a condensate circulating inside of the trapping potential, and then developing the quantized vortex on its boundary, like this way. A little bit squeezed, and then form up the nuclear uh, quantized vortices, and then getting larger, and then after the two seconds, somehow the shape of the condensate is somewhat mushed away, and then showing the turbulent 
uh, flow and then disorder the structure of the vortices of there. Our understanding is like this. Uh, here, uh, again, that the cross-section of the quadruple magnetic field. Here's the experimental plane. As you can see, the radial trapping potential is in very non-harmony. At the center, we have a harmonic potential, but outer of center position, we have almost linear potential. So once the condenser is rotating, circulating inside this trap, then in off center, it will see some kind of an isotropic uh, uh, potential. Because the radial trapping frequency and azimuthal trapping frequency are different, these off center positions. So once this condenser is circulating in this way, obviously the condenser would feel that the rotating anisotropic potential. Then we know very well, once the condensate feels the rotating anisotropic potential, it will develop the surface mode, and then the surface mode and then subsequently develop the quantized vortices near the boundary that way. So that is, I think, is our understanding for in these situations. And then this is the intrap uh, in situ uh, images of our condensate. As you can see, the shape is kind of uh, circulating and rotating. And then rotating frequency is the same as a driving frequency. But uh, here, uh, this uh, trapping frequency much lower than the, the center trapping frequency. So obviously, in this situation, the condensate is kind of rotating, and the condensate shape is rotating much faster than that its local trapping frequency. So it's a very unstable condition. So you cannot find a steady condition in this uh, situation. So then, is it exploding at this point? And then kind of external angular momentum of a central mass motion is kind of developed into the uh, very large vertices over there. And then show that some, this kind of a turbulent behavior. This is kind of basic, our, our basic understanding about the superfluid dynamics. And also, but I want to point out, this uh, dynamics is very complicated than what we can imagine. Uh, one aspect is kind of, uh, we have a very inhomogeneous effective magnetic field. I want to remind you that our gauge field is not uniform at all. It's just generated by the monopole itself. So when the condenser is moving around, it experiences a very different spatial variation of the uh, gauge field. So apparently, when you take a, a call of the Lorentz force for a given uniform superfluid velocity, then obviously this non give you the non-zero, which means that when this condenser kind of a nicely move uh, uniform velocity, it, it, even in that case, it will feel some kind of sure force due to the kind of net kind of a Lorentz force effect. So uh, moving uh, superfluid dynamics you know, in homogeneous gauge field is very interesting, I, I think, a topic uh, in terms of uh, superfluid dynamics. And then uh, to characterize this dynamics, uh, we just uh, take a two seconds relaxation, and then the condensate forms that very ni nice uh, lattice structures. And then we count that the uh, vertex number, and this is what we have. The vertex number increased uh, up to the over 100 within uh, two seconds, and uh, very nicely, and it's saturated up there. And uh, we don't honestly don't know why it is saturated up to the 100 now, but want to figure out. And also, the condensate fraction is uh, still up there, 80%, so the heating is not that high. But the atom number is decreasing a lot. This is uh, probably due to the adiabatic spin condition is breaking by the fast moving of the condensate in our magnetic traps. The next is uh, how we can quantify our uh, whole response. Uh, I have to move fast. So first one is uh, how much energy we put in the y-directional motion can be a one candidate quantity for this quantitative measure for the whole response. And we measure that uh, the y-directional motion energy uh, for various uh, driving frequency. And uh, from the single particle of simulation, we can expect this kind of a quartic behavior for the, as a function of the driving time. And it's pretty much nice. And then, and also is another quantity would be the vertex nucleation rate. And then we measure the vertex number for the as function of the driving frequency. And then we observe also the same dependency of the driving frequency as this uh, this kind of uh, y directional motion energy increasing rate. So from this observation, we can say, okay, pro probably the vertex nucleation rate might prop uh, properly uh, indicating the. Qu quantitatively, the, the size of the response, whole response of our system. So this is what we measured, uh, the nucleation, vertex nucleation rate as a function of the magnetic flux penetrating through the, our condensate. So we control the separation between the, this monopole and the condensate, and then measure this, uh, uh, this kind of monotonic behavior of the vertex nucleation rate. 
Here is a zero means is that kind of a zero field point is up there. So if you have a uniform spin texture, here is a very close uh, distance, which means like a more winding spin textures. Okay, next uh, we just uh, demonstrated also, uh, furthermore, we uh, apply the elliptical driving in this situation. Probably uh, there might be a, some critical polarization of the driving, uh, elliptical driving, which might cancel perfectly of the Lorentz force uh, in your case. So that's our motivation, and this is what we have in the clockwise rotation and counterclockwise rotation, and you can see that the symmetry is broken. This symmetry is broken, obviously, due to the chirality of the spin texture. So here's a linear driving. You have a vertex generation. But here's a left, a little bit kind of a counterclockwise rotation would cancel out the kind of Lorentz force effect. And then the vertex number is very small. And also, we checked that this one is a vertex sign, as this sign are different, opposite to each other. And then finally, I would like to put out the output. OK, next question uh, I want to have. Uh, Automatically, I would have is a, uh, can we use this kind of mechanism using that the real atomic spin texture as a, one of the alternative way to generate a gauge field for our quantum gas experiment? Uh, generating artificial gauge field is kind of very, very hot topics in these days. And then there's a wonderful demonstration about that one using the Lyman laser dressing and the laser assisted tunneling, optical laser shaking, all of them. But it's a two approach that the, the strong regime uh, we need to make a high density squamial lattice uh, uh, spin textures uh, to use that kind of uh, real atom spin textures. But probably one might try to use that uh, nano, uh, magnetic nanostructures or atom technology to make a, that kind of uh, high density squamial lattice uh, spin textures and so on. And then this is a summary. So we, I just presented a very simple setup, but uh, due to the spin texture in the magnetic trap, one can detect that kind of effective magnetic field and the Lorentz forces. And then we, with the linear driving, we observe the circular motions of the condensate. Also, we checked out that the broken inverse symmetry with the spin texture is the kind of elliptical driving of our system. So, and then this is the photo of our uh, group members. And then finally, I want to show this slide. Uh, in <laughs> I'm living in Seoul. And then two years later, we will have an ICAP in Seoul. So I'd like to welcome all of you to the next ICAP in Seoul. Thank you so much. Thank you for this very interesting talk. It is now open for questions. Uh, Young, you presented this uh, very intuitive picture that uh, because of the spin texture, uh, you have a coreless vortex and this corresponds to mass current. Now I want to relate it to the gauge field and I want to you know, pick my words carefully. Is the mass current in your spin or condensate due to this magnetic monopole the same as the Meissner current in a superconductor if you had a real mon monopole at the same position. So in other words, is there this analogy, we, we call it you know, synthetic magnetic field, we call it synthetic monopoles or analogous to magnetic monopoles, but is the anal analogy such that the current, the mass current in the superfluid is identical to the charge current in a superconductor if we had a real monopole? I guess the answer is no, because uh, here is a superfluid, neutral superfluid. Even though it's a circulating, it does not make any kind of counter magnetic field for that kind of active magnetic field. So it might be a little bit different from that uh, Meissner current. So this superfluid simply kind of being acted, does not make any kind of back action with the charge current up there. So. Uh, I have a question also. Mm -hmm. um, on the, the first part of your talk where you show this circular motion, mm -hmm. I have a very basic question. Um, if there is a small anisotropy in uh, the potential mm -hmm. and you start to excite the motion along one given direction, if this is not a full eigendirection of the trap because of a small anisotropy, yes. wouldn't it also 
uh, and show that there is a transverse motion in the other direction and explain what you see. Could you comment on that? Yes, yes. When you have a different trapping frequency along the X and Y, and if you drive the linear in the diagonal direction, then you start with the linear motion and the machine elliptical and the circular, and then later when the elliptical and the linear, some sort of lizard motion or something like that. But that is a free propagating system. This is a linearly driven system. So even with the anisotropic, if you are linearly driving, then the only you can have ellipticity is very small kind of elliptical motions. So you cannot make a full oscillation at all. So it's a, remember that this is a driven system. And then we also confirm that with a very simple calculations. But and this is different from that uh, free oscillator at all. So, yes. OK. So. I don't see any other questions. We thank you again. Thank you. Be sure that we shall enjoy coming to Seoul. <laughs> <laughs>